Today I am delighted to speak with Susan Zumo. Susan, you are a master teacher of higher consciousness with over 30 years of transformative experience. You are also an author and a spiritual life guide, guiding individuals toward a soul-directed life and merging spiritual principles with everyday practicality. You are a certified practitioner in various modalities and you are passionate about guiding individuals on a soul-directed path to higher consciousness. Susan, it's such a, a pleasure to speak with you today. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, uh, I'm very excited for these topics that we will uh, explore and uh, just hinting a little bit uh, now, I would, uh, I'm very much intrigued by the, the language of the soul. That's one thing I want to discuss with you. And also living a, a soul-directed life, which are things that you uh, talk about. Uh, before we go there, I would like to ask you to give us uh, some kind of um, milestone or highlight from your life. I know there are many to choose from, but pick one that maybe will set the tone for this conversation that uh, we're about uh, to, have, to, to have. That's a good question. Um, most recently, I was in meditation and made the discovery of something that has guided my entire life. And that is my desire and need to rescue others, to help others, to fix things for them. And as you can imagine, that can be a, a, something that can trip me up because I'm imposing my will on others. I'm focused on others and it's always been a driving force in my life. While I was in meditation, I was able to discover the original cause of, of how that came about in me and in my life. And as a result of healing that and releasing that, it shifted my frequency and cleared my, my energy so that I was able to learn new and different things and receive higher energy, higher information from my soul. And as a result, I'm rewriting um, and writing new workshops to change the information. So that's been a big shift for me. And that's happened in the last couple months. Oh, that's great. And you know, there was uh, there was something that when you were describing, you used the word rescue others, which is quite a strong word because, you know, helping others is one thing, but rescuing others, it implies that <laughs> they are in, in, in deep uh, problems. So uh, I, I, uh, that's something I picked from uh, the way that, uh, that you said. I suppose that would be similar to the... The, the pressure or the burden you had to impose that on, on others. Exactly, because I didn't just have a session and let it go. Mm -hmm. It stayed with me. And mm -hmm. I, I was working on it sometimes more than they were. Yeah. Um, and, and it is a pressure. And it was not good for either of us, for me and anybody else. That's great. Thank you for sharing this uh, with us, Susan. So let's... Uh, Let's talk about uh, intuition. Actually, that's what I wanted to start uh, talking about. And intuition is often considered the the voice of the soul. Am I correct in saying that? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. So, can you can you tell me a bit more about uh, about that the the voice of the soul and the intuition, and then we'll we'll carry on from there. Yeah. Your, your, soul, your soul is intimately connected to you through your heart. And your soul is a voice that whispers. It does not shout. And so in our everyday lives, we have so many voices talking to us. There are the voices in the outside world, work, friends, um, family. There are our own inner voices, the voice of the critic, 
the voice of the parent, the voice of the, the child, the voice of, of, you know, just multiple voices. And so the voice of the soul is very soft. It can be in words. Some people hear their, their soul speak. It can be symbolic. It can be life events. It's more of a whisper than a shout. And so for us to hear the voice of the soul, we have to be able to distinguish the other voices within us, such as our fear voice. Um, and we have to learn how to listen. And when we hear it, we want to act on it. That's what makes it louder. So people who say, oh, I knew that. Oh, I should have done that. Oh, I, I knew better than that. Oh, that's right. I had that feeling. That's the soul communicating and us ignoring it. So it, the more we learn to listen, the, the stronger that voice gets and the easier the guidance is. And our soul is that guiding voice that is never going to steer us wrong. Uh, that's a, a wonderful uh, explanation you just gave us here. And uh, there were two things I wanted to go deeper on with what you just said. And the, the first one, you said it's important to distinguish that soft voice from the other voices, the voice of fear and all, all those uh, <laughs> things that are happening inside our, uh, our mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so can... Uh, I suppose you appreciate, like many of us do appreciate, that this is not always easy to distinguish because exactly the other voices are so loud that they tend to, you know, uh, drown this kind of uh, whisper, as you, as you very rightly said. So can you share with me what's one practice, what's something that one can incorporate to be able to distinguish this, uh, the soft whisper of the intuition mm -hmm. from the more louder voices of the, the mind? It's a good question. Um, two things. Mm. The first is to know that your soul will never criticize you. Your soul will never scold you. Um, and your soul will never should you. So your soul voice is always going to come with a feeling of love and support and compassion. Your soul is, is not a stern teacher who, who wants to yell at you or tell you that you're stupid or anything like that. So <clears throat> that's one way to distinguish your soul voice from your fear voice. Now your soul may say, that's not a good idea, which is different from if you do that, something terrible is gonna happen. Mm. So that's one way to tell them apart. <clears throat> the other is, I'm not a firm believer in extensive periods of meditation. I know a lot of people who are into meditation and, and you know, I like to do a, a good solid one um, regularly. But to hear the soul, 30 seconds, 60 seconds of silence. Just sit for one minute and then open yourself to hearing rather than talking. We do a lot of talking internally, but we don't do a lot of listening. And so what I would recommend is to sit throughout the day for one minute, no longer than that, and just be open to hearing the inner voice. And if you don't, that's okay, because it'll come later. And that would be the best way to start. You can get more information from your soul in one minute than you might think. Do you suggest to put that minute somewhere in particular in, in our day <laughs> between activities? What, when is a good time to pick that minute? I would say in the morning. You know, if you want to sit on the side of the bed before you get up and, and do that minute um, during the day, especially if, if you're at, at work, to take that break from all that mental activity. Um, <clears throat> the most important thing is to fit it into your day. 
mm-hmm. not to be rigid about where it's going to happen, right? Okay. You can make an appointment with your soul and say every day at 9 a.m. I'm going to say hi. Um, and you can do that. But you can also say, I need a little more flexibility in my schedule. So I will call you every day, but it might be at a different time because for the soul, there is no time. Of course. And thank you for these uh, practical things because it's uh, it's important. I believe we both agree on that to uh, not, you know, theoretically discuss about these concepts. We could, but that's not really not uh, the point of uh, this uh, interaction that we're having. Um, there was another thing that you said that I believe is very important, even more important maybe. The, the first is to recognize and distinguish that whisper of the intuition, but the second thing is to act on it. Yes. And that's again something that not everyone so easily does even though the voice is there and the nods maybe is there still that is not necessarily enough to make someone take the the action and i suppose (laughs) i will let you tell me what stands in the way really of doing that and maybe with what way one can overcome that and actually take the action needed on uh, their intuition well, there's a couple, a uh, couple ways. Um, sometimes we learn by not listening repeatedly, and yes. we kind of catch a clue that <laughs> not listening is not such a good thing for me. It's painful. <laughs> it's painful. <laughs> um, so that that could be one way to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say start off with small things. Don't start off asking your soul, "Should I marry this person?" Should I quit my job and move across country? You know, start with little things so that you can build a foundation of success and build that relationship. So my, my philosophy is spiritual, a spiritual led life, an intuition led life, a soul directed life is only good if it improves your everyday life. Because we don't live in a world, at least I don't, where I could sit in my home and meditate and hang out in the higher energies all day long. I still have to do laundry. I still have to work. Right. I still have to live a a three dimensional life. I don't believe we should make them separate. I believe that they should be integrated as one. And so I don't separate my spiritual life from my daily life. I I apply one to the other. So I will ask, um, you know, where do I need to go to find a birthday present for a friend of mine? Um, You know, what's the the best route to take to avoid the traffic? Little things. And then, you know, I know a lot of people like to create parking spots because they don't Mm -hmm. like to walk, right? Once you've done that and you've got that practice then, then you say, oh, I can trust my intuition on something bigger. And then you move into the, the larger things. Um, the other thing is listen to your body. You know, a lot of times the soul will talk to you through your physical body. And as you're thinking about or contemplating a path or a situation, um, how does your body feel? For example, before you and I connected, I sat down and asked my intuition, is this someone that I will be compatible with? Is this someone that I can work with? Um, Does this person have the same motive that I have? Right. And and every everything in me went, oh, yeah, this is good. That's good to know. (laughs) You see, and that's when I sent the message. Mm -hmm. So practical things are are important. And that's Mm -hmm. where the practice comes in. It was one of the things that uh, caught my attention when I was uh, reading about you, Susan. You you were saying exactly what you said now, but I will read it back because it really uh, caught my attention, as I said. And you, you said that you believe that the practicalities of everyday life must be guided by spiritual practices and that spiritual practices must have practical applications In daily life, and that's something that I consider to be fascinating because 
and very useful also because mm. for many people, uh, because of maybe the way they grew up or even religion had something to do with it, but in many people's uh, idea of spirituality is what you said, detaching from the, you know, the life that we live here from your job and your family and whatever else and going to the uh, monastery or in the cave to meditate for but <laughs> this may be a part of the journey but <laughs> that's I don't think that is the real um, it's not what really spirituality is so let me ask you tell me your thoughts on what I just said well it, it reminds me of um, many years ago um, I was doing this work full time and I started to get very narrow. So I didn't, I didn't have anyone in my life who didn't know what chakras were. And if you, you didn't know this, then, then I didn't want to. And I thought people who were in the corporate world were just terrible. Didn't want to have anything to do with them. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, I had a friend ask me to come, uh, manage his office while he was setting up another location. And, and I'm saying to him, oh, no, 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 I don't do that. You know, I don't, I don't do that. And, and that's what I'm saying in my head. When I opened up my mouth, I said, of course, I'd be happy to do that. And I was horrified. And my intuition said to me, how do you expect for people in the corporate world to connect with their soul if you don't go to them? And I, I went, okay. So in all the years that I, I've worked in corporate, um, which have been for the last 40, 45 years, um, I take it back 30 years, 35 years. I'm not good with dates. But anyway, the people that I've worked with, I've used my intuition to guide them through their careers and their personal lives. And so instead of pushing them in a direction, then I listen to what really suits this person, what's really going to help this person. And so coaching sessions at work became spiritual counseling sessions. And so I know that no matter who I've ever worked with in whatever capacity, their life is improved, not just they're climbing the successful ladder or they're making more money or that kind of thing. And, and as much as I resisted moving into that world because I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to do my work, I wouldn't be a spiritual, you know, that kind of thing. I'd be in a competition area. It's really allowed me to touch more people than I ever would have. And it's really taught me that that my definition of how someone should use their intuition or listen to their guidance is not necessarily the most important thing. It's what's important for the other person. So listening and knowing how to, how to help a person overcome their fear is, is what I use it for. But then I have to use it to overcome my own fears. And, and that's the other lesson is that we teach what we need to learn. So every time I open my mouth, I, I hear the little voice going, are you listening? And I'm like, yes, I'm listening. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what came to mind when you were speaking. Absolutely. And uh, you just said now, and uh, <laughs> you said you, you teach what you need to learn and that kind of you know, resonated really because it's not something that always comes up for me that this is <laughs> so thank you. No, that's uh, that's wonderful. And you know, this there are no answers like in the way that uh, this is that I the answer I was uh, looking for. So uh, thank you for sharing it. Um, Susan, I wanted to ask, uh, we have discussed about uh, intuition and you know honing it and uh, listening to it and acting on it um i think what's um maybe the the purpose or the intention be for doing that is eventually to align with what 
our soul. Let's say uh, I'm trying to find the right word because many words here are very. Uh, but, uh, let's say what the the soul suggests. I, I will use a very you know <laughs> easy, gentle uh, word for that. So um, you talk about you know. Um, Soul purpose, unique soul purpose. I think that was the exact phrase that uh, that you say. So, I wanted to ask you, how do you mean a unique soul purpose? And again, I will ask you, what's advice that you would give someone listening to that and realizing, yes, that makes sense. How to move towards that? Oh, that's a good question. Um, there's two things about soul purpose. It's not always as grand as everybody thinks it is. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> it, it can be very, very um, unique to each individual and also very simple. So many people want to help others um, and they feel a call to service. And so they feel that the only way that they can accomplish that goal, that, goal, that purpose is to do something on a global scale, to do something on a grand scale. And while that may be the purpose for some, for most people, the way that they do that is to learn to love themselves mm -hmm. and to love others. So the, the sole purpose for just about every individual on the planet, I would say every individual, is to learn to love themselves and then to love others. Now, some people come in with two goals and they have a driving force to accomplish something. And that driving force will override their, their um, willful desires, their personality desires, right? And you know if you have that drive and you know if you're on the path because things will be comfortable for you. Not, not comfortable as in, oh, this is good, I feel comfortable, but comfortable as in not a lot of obstacles. Hmm. When you're in your soul path, you don't have a lot of obstacles. When you start to veer off to the right or the left, that's when you get into trouble. So, for example, um, I have the first sole purpose, to learn to love myself and to love others. My overriding drive is to teach others about their soul and their, their higher self and their inner truth. Every time I have decided that I am going to live a life of domesticity, I'm, I'm going to focus on just being grandma. I'm going to focus on, you know, just, just working day to day. Things don't go right for me. Mm -hmm. I don't feel well. I don't sleep well. I, I have this nagging conversation in my head over and over and over again. I'm out of balance. Mm -hmm. When I am working with others like this or teaching or doing sessions, Everything is great. And then when I leave that, the rest of my life feels good. So I can't ignore one for the other. I can't only do this and ignore the other. But in the end, and what I tell everybody is, I, I'm, not, I'm not a famous person. I'm not the person you see on TV, you know, on, on doing all of that kind of thing. Um, and some people have that. That is their purpose, to reach a global audience. My purpose is not to be famous, but my work is important. And the people that I touch, I know it has an impact. And so I know that when I start to step out of that lane, things don't go well. Mm -hmm. When I stay in that lane, things go very, very well. If I'm not caring for myself or, or really loving myself by nurturing myself, feeding myself, you know, taking care of myself um, and just appreciating myself, then my spiritual work suffers. 
because I can't relate to others in the way that I want to. So spiritual purpose and soul purpose, when you're not loving yourself, life is not going well. And when you are loving yourself, your soul is like, yeah, let's send all the good stuff. Does that kind of answer it or... Yeah, and what you were saying about, uh, you know, it's not that you don't have challenges, that you are co comfortable, that, but th there are not obstacles as such. The things that, the word that came to my mind was resistance or friction or that thing like you feel like you're swimming upstream where everything is against you. That that That's what I, I got as a... Uh, and I think we've all been there and we know yeah. what that feels like. So it's good to have the, you know, the understanding of why this might be happening and really uh, do what uh, we need to do to change. Yeah. If you find yourself pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing, you probably a sign that you're pushing. <laughs> you <know? laughs> Just kind of sit back and see what happens. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's nothing wrong with with saying to your, your soul or your higher self, you know, put the right thing on the path for me. Put the right person on the path for me. And be open to remembering that it's not just us. I I always try to remember that that I'm the, the number one pin and there are 10 pins behind me or nine pins behind me that I'm not seeing that are there to support me. And so we have to not be arrogant in thinking that I'm doing everything. We have to remember that, that there are nine other unseen supporting loving forces behind us that want to help, but they can't do anything if we don't ask. And so we have to remember to ask for help. And that's a big one in this world. A lot of people are taught not to do that. It's weak, but it's not. You get weak when you try to do everything yourself. Yes, indeed. And thank you also for uh, highlighting this, the asking, asking for help, asking your uh, Higher self for help or asking for it is uh, yeah asking thank you so thank you for uh, yeah. highlighting this uh, this point I think it's very important and I'm I'm only saying that again and again because I know that I was not doing it for a large portion of my life so there are others that are like that they, they never do and they don't even realize where are mm -hmm. others uh, that uh, do it. Uh, Susan, it's it's a truly fascinating conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have a couple of uh, quick fire questions to uh, conclude and wrap it up. And before sure. I ask you them, uh, where do you want to direct the, the listener who has uh, enjoyed listening to you very much and wants to uh, go to the next level and find out more. They can um, visit my website, which is susanzumo.com. Mm -hmm. um, they can email me at susanzumo at gmail.com. Um, I have videos up on YouTube that I do weekly, which are just inspirational messages. I have a group that meets on the first Monday of every month. That's free group. Um, just connect, meditate, um, have community. And then I'm starting up a, a new workshop series in January called The Foundation, um, which is exactly that. It's a foundational workshop um, to help people get get going, regardless of where their their level is. Um, otherwise, that's, you know, that's really just kind of me. <laughs> 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 That's wonderful. Um, uh, and uh, so, Susan, I have two the two final questions. I always ask them uh, to my guests. And the first one is, what does personal development mean to you? It means that I'm continuing to always learn and grow. Um, there's that line from, from the song, um, uh, The Greatest Love of All. I love myself the way I am and still I want to grow. That's what personal development is for me. 
That's beautiful. Uh, thank you. And a hypothetical question. If you could go back in time and meet your 18-year-old uh, Susan, uh, your 18-year-old self, what's one piece of advice you would give her? I would tell her, don't wait until you're in your 60s to stop being afraid. <laughs> then I'd have to tell her how, but that's what I would tell her. <laughs> uh, thank you. And um, Susan, I want to thank you very much for this uh, really absorbing conversation. I enjoyed it very much. I believe we uh, extracted uh, a lot of useful value and wisdom, if you want, uh, hopefully, or insights for uh, the listeners. Um, I want to wish you all the very best with your uh, mission and your uh, unique soul purpose, how you were describing it. Uh, before we conclude, what's one last piece of advice or uh, a simple practice that our listeners can uh, implement, uh, you know, maybe as a a continuation of what we discussed about today. Um, first, I want to say thank you to you and, and bless you for the work that you're doing. You're a wonderful, wonderful, loving light. And I appreciate the time that we've spent together. I would tell the people who are listening that if you're not doing something out of love, stop doing it immediately ask yourself, am I doing this because I love myself so much that I couldn't do anything else? Or am I doing this because I'm afraid of something will happen if I don't? And use that as your guiding force. Right now, the most important thing every single person on earth can do is embrace a love of self, a love of soul, and then a love of others. Thank you. Thank you.